Welcome to the Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. My guest today is Mr. Austin Branch. Mr. Branch is an information operations pioneer, practitioner, and leader. He holds the distinction of being the Army's very first information operations officer when that career field was just forming. And while in uniform, he served at the tactical, operational, and strategic levels. Since retirement from the Army, Mr. Branch served in several senior executive civilian roles within the Department of Defense, which focused on information operations, cyber, and counterterrorism. Most recently, he co-founded the Information Professionals Association, or IPA. Austin Branch, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Hey, hello, John. And I hello. am thinking that there has to be a really interesting story about how you became the Army's first information operations officer. Um, I don't know how interesting it is, but it's uh, certainly a, a little unique. You know, many years ago in the... Um, and I think it was 94, after I finished uh, my time as an infantry uh, company commander, I went off to be a, become a psychological operations officer and uh, finished the training, went off uh, and did some extraordinary assignments as a military information support team leader. And then a year into that, I had the opportunity to, uh, to interview and ultimately was selected and joined the Joint Special Operations Command in their J3 staff in uh, 1995. And in, in that role, I was a psychological operations officer, but I joined their command and control warfare uh, cell, the office in the J3. Again, an extraordinary experience with an a, uh, unbelievable organization as we were pioneering new ideas to, uh, to operate in, the, in this complex command and control warfare information environment to help uh, support our, our very special operations forces. In that role, I started to, we started to really kind of learn tools, uh, techniques, methods, and applications, and we were just uh, training ourselves as we were um, uh, trying to evolve capability for our special operators. It wasn't uh, long after, late 90, 95, 96, that the, the Army and uh, was really looking at establishing a, uh, a functional area that was called functional area 30 information operations. I was unaware that they were doing that, but my com uh, commander and leadership had indicated that, hey, this is a interesting, um, this is an interesting um, um, career field. You ought to give it some serious thought because uh, you, know, you're, you seem to be enjoying and you're doing well in the command and control warfare space. As a result, I actually I, I made that decision uh, to uh, to do the necessary paperwork to apply to become an FA thirty, only to find out that I, think I had one of the first packets in. It was the first one approved. I was uh, I was proud, a little shocked, and it was also a kind of a mysterious path. Is you know I left the infantry. I was leaving psychological operations specifically, but going into this new new space called information operations. And I'll tell you, I've never looked back since. It's that, that is awesome. So you you mentioned, I believe that that was the 1995 yes. time time frame. So that's frame. That, that's that's 25 25 years. Uh, how has information operations evolved during uh, the last 25 years since you've been seriously immersed in it? Uh, seriously immersed is an understatement. It has defined my professional and to some extent my personal career. Um, because I've never left it. It's been a it's been a roller coaster ride. Uh, been uh, you know it's been one of uh, trying to define the space, trying to establish some identity, trying to find uh, um, to to uh, to demonstrate credibility, relevance, and the value added of of uh, operating in the information space because it's. It was so new and so uh, a little complex because it, it, it married up many different established capabilities. And, um, and, it, uh, and, and quite frankly, the, you, when you couldn't see, touch, taste, and smell the results, the outputs, and the outcomes, it was very difficult 
for other war fighters and, 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 and planners to really see the value and understand the value uh, and, and, it's, and the role of, of that space. So again, a roller coaster ride spent a lot, I guess I used to joke that the first target audience of an information operations officer was always, always his own staff is to say, hey, hey, listen, guys, you know, I'm relevant. This, this, uh, this mission area is, is critically important, and let me explain why. And we would go, we'd spend some time trying to integrate into the battle staff in a meaningful way. And, that, and again, that was episodic, very personality dependent. And as the Army itself and other services were evolving their own thought in this space, as was the Department of Defense. Remember, when we're talking about harnessing at that time because they called the pillars of uh, information operations they were harnessing estab well established uh, capabilities electronic warfare and, and psychological operations and military deceptions that already had their own identity they already had their own capabilities and training and and all such and so when you tried to squeeze them together it's it was um, it became very challenging you know the equities were cha uh, were, were challenged uh, there was friction, uh, there was a lack of understanding, and I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many conferences I went to where we're, all we talked about were, were definitions and, uh, and, and whose role was whose role and who had what responsibility. It, uh, it really, we were mired for many, many years. But at the same time, in the tactical space, there were great successes in support of special operations and some superb uh, examples in our operations in the Balkans and Kosovo and and uh, and, uh, uh, and, Bo and Bosnia, where we actually uh, we're actually really were spotlighted, mm. kind of non-kinetic kind of information-related activities that were uh, necessary for those types of uh, operations. A lot of great precedent was set there. Right. So, well. So well, so t so, uh, ta tactical success is uh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. It does not necessarily parlay to uh, strategic harmony, uh, and I I I think I'm I'm still hearing you express a little bit of challenge in the national strategic landscape. How, how are things uh, strategically, would you say? And it, it is America or the, the West or the free world, how, how are we positioned to you know, compete in the information environment? I, I'd say today that we're getting a little bit better. Um, and, and remember, there's, uh, as I mentioned, there, there's pockets of excellence. Uh, there's superb examples of extraordinary work that's been done in this space. But as a, as a whole, we remain challenged. With the pressures that the Chinese and the Russians have placed upon mm -hmm. uh, the competition in, this, in the information environment, it has is, uh, it is, it is created this pressure to... Uh, for the uh, U.S. government and certainly the Department of Defense to kind of uh, reevaluate how we're organized and uh, how we how we um, orient our capabilities towards competition in the information environment. And there's been some, uh, you know, they've raised the priority level of some of this work uh, because we're being threatened on a daily basis. And so uh, to, uh, five years ago, I would tell you that we're desperately still struggling to 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 carve out that uh, that space even though there were some f superb attempts like the IO roadmap and right at uh, you know in, uh, in 2000 and 2001 and and the you know and then other efforts like the information operations task force at the joint staff and then the establishment of uh, service organizations to move forward that was you know that waned uh, over over time and uh, with the pressures of the Russian Chinese has now kind of gotten everybody's attention. It, it's I'll tell you the establishment uh, the decision to uh, have the information of the seventh war fighting function was very very important. Mm -hmm. uh, the documents that have been now uh, some of the documents and that have been generated that have come out of the department uh, emphasizing the importance and role of information and and frankly, We've had some pretty extraordinary leadership 
um, from uh, select senior leaders um, in the department who have said and, and said, "Look, this is critically important, and we're and we're gonna um, and we're gonna move forward." Um, we've had some Marine Corps senior leaders who have been ex exceptional thought leaders in this space, and have made some tough decisions to uh, to, to to kind of orient. Uh, not only the department, but their own services into into this space, and having to carve out resources to to develop capability. Now we're not there yet. Certainly, at the we still uh, we've got a long way to go to to compete and win uh, um, against uh, our adversaries and those who want to challenge our interests, particularly the Russians and the Chinese in this space, who have in fact prioritized competition in the information environment <laughs> and, and they've. They, clearly would uh, advantage their interests um, but uh, we still have ways to go but I think there's been some uh, there's been some headway certainly in the last uh, last two years right well it's so as you're saying their uh, adversaries Russia China other state and non-state actors have prioritized uh, information operations and that that implies at least to me that uh, some kind of security apparatus is necessary for the West and the United States. So how, how do we approach the, you know, security and stealing ourselves against the information threat? Well, first, I believe that it's, uh, that it's not just the, the role and mission of a small cadre of information professionals. Mm. To be able to compete in a meaningful way, it's an all-in proposition. That's yeah. only government, but it's also the private sector, which is, being, which is also being critically threatened right. uh, in this space. And, um, and so I, uh, I believe that being able to kind of um, uh, to have a common orientation uh, to have a uh, shared understanding of the outputs and outcomes that the uh, that we all might have that and we'll find that there's a lot of commonalities and uh, and that uh, that we have some uh, leadership that's able to kind of harness um, what we're our capabilities our tools our extraordinary technical talent and capability and um, and then provide as I mentioned before this kind of common orientation that doesn't mean uh, centralized control. It means there's a, uh, you know, a U.S. government has this tremendous power to do to convene. And imagine if you can convene and provide, uh, you know, kind of a general understanding of, of our, you know, where our strategic interests are and what might be consistent with the interest of industry or other private sector entities or the public. And then, and then, uh, and allow others to kind of organized to uh, shape their interests but interests that uh, and and that are common to um, our broader national strategic and global strategic uh, security so um, I think the power to convene is is is, uh, is is a useful government capability uh, I, I believe in a strategy of a network of networks mm. a, uh, I believe in a strategy that not only has a network of networks but you convene to uh, inspire, and then you can activate, in other words, with resources and very thoughtful engagement, you can activate and orient uh, certain activities, and then um, watch and, and then help those metastasize. Uh, that's the only way we're, we're really going to, to, to beat, to, to compete in this space, and, uh, but it has to be very thoughtful, and it also has to be uh, it's it's not only a DOD thing. A DOD complements much of that, right. a critical component of our security and stability stability mandates. But uh, but it's also the private sector and uh, and how we engage in those interests without without perturbing or without um, poisoning the punch for their you know interests. We don't want to politicize these things. We just got to move out, right? Protect our interests. Well, speaking of uh, c uh, convening, uh, you <laughs> and some like-minded colleagues recently uh, founded the Information Professionals Association, or IPA, uh, nonprofit. Uh, it that obviously fits into everything that 
we've been discussing. Tell 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 us more about IPA and sure. what your what your charter is and and how how it is designed to fit into this whole this whole challenge. Right. So, John, um, folks can go to I, uh, to information professionals dot org to get uh, more detailed information. But the big idea was that just a few years ago there was a, a group of folks and and, uh, uh, and even some staffers on the hill and and others who were saying, you know. Where, where is there an advocacy for this missionary? There's advocacy and great organizations that are focused on cyber. There's some exceptional organizations for, focused on electronic warfare and others in certain specific areas. But where, where, where are the interests of the, of the broader uh, idea of, of, of competition in the information environment where the nexus of hard science and soft science um, you know, kind of that sweet spot where that occurs. Where is there an organization, or there is is there a professional association? Is there some place that these professionals that integrate these uh, capabilities can go, not only to collaborate but to network and to advance critical thought in this space? And the answer was no. So uh, a small group of us uh, formed this, and we needed something to be independent, something to be Switzerland mm -hmm. for, uh, for this missionary. So we, we formed a 501c3 and c6, it's a and, uh, foundation as well, that would serve that purpose. And we also bright, um, we, you know, uh, broadened its uh, representation, not just for IO. IO is simply a term, information operation, is simply two words used to describe the integration of a host of capabilities, the outputs and outcomes, and 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 uh, operational application in the military sense of uh, of a host of capabilities that are calibrated for a specific purpose. Um, that does not really jive with our broader the broader audience I was talking about. So we, how do you frame it? So we had uh, Dr. Rand Waltzman some years ago had been talking about the idea of cognitive security. And that kind of made sense to us. We said, that is broader. That's better to understand. It's part of our new 21st century mm -hmm. security architecture. You have cyber, you have physical security, you have others. We have a cognitive security piece. Branding is being challenged. Reputations are being challenged. Yeah. Fake, fake news, These uh, uh, all the things that are happening in social media and the digital space. Do you know if it's real information, if it's valid? How do you reconcile that? So this is in our face every single day. It's not just governments, it's industry as well. So how do we form an organization that also attends to those issues? So we, we really wrapped our arms around the idea of cognitive security as well. So here we are as, a, uh, as, a, as an organization that advances these types of thoughts and competition in the information environment and uh, tools, methods, applications, thought, and, uh, you know, and, um, and, and not only those ideas, but broader, bigger, you know, um, uh, thoughts about how do we um, make sure that we don't, uh, that that governments and militaries and other organizations uh, recognize the value of having capability in, in the space and, and, uh, and what threats are out there. And, and, and that's, an, as we all know, it's a very ubiquitous, information and environment is a ubiquitous space. And uh, and things change every day, so we got to stay on top of this. And we want to be great represent, uh, representatives. We really want to be a platform for this collaboration amongst this community of prof global community of professionals. Let's say that I'm uh, you know completely unfamiliar with with information operations, cognitive security, information warfare. What what is a a, a good uh, beginner book or an introductory book that uh, that you could recommend to uh, to to a lay audience to get to 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 wet their whistle on uh, this whole discussion. Well, right, uh, there are so many, and there's also a lot of white papers. There's a lot of uh, uh, student, uh, you know, war college uh, documents, um, and a host of other material, but. I'll tell you what, believe it or not, and remember I told you I, I got introduced to these ideas of competition in the complex information environment and its uh, and the strategies and, and its its role and importance early on 
in uh, 1995 when I started in the command and control warfare space, when a uh, when a boss of mine handed me um, uh, some of the Toffler books um, um, and. Um, Alvin and Heidi Toffler, as they were looking into the future, uh, you know, future shock, third wave, war and anti-war, and and um, and all the challenges that we are seeing today, right? And so that really kind of got me interested, and and I and then I kind of, you know, juxtaposed those um, those kind of big thoughts onto the operational environment I was experiencing back then, and what I imagined might be in the future. And um, so that inspired me to, to study more and to get deep, more deeply involved. And then, and then, quite frankly, I became incredibly uh, proud and honored um, to be, um, you know, luckily one of the, the group of pioneers in this space that where we, um, where we were, you know, carving out uh, what works, what doesn't work, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, watching our adversaries evolve. Uh, how do you organize for these things? So, uh, a lot to read out there. But the reality is, it, you know, this is not going away. It's only going to become more complex and and uh, and and more challenging. Uh, competition in the global information environment is being advanced by extraordinary technology and even more extraordinary breakthroughs on the horizon. So, uh, this is definitely the knowledge age and the information age. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if, um, if that's in fact the truth, which it is, <laughs> then uh, we most certainly under need to understand how to operate and compete and, and, um, and, and win. Uh, yeah. What's at stake for this is, 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 is as we watch our, even our own democracy and our political process being challenged. Uh, both in the information environment, both technically and non-technically, shaping perceptions and attitudes towards our electoral process. You know, um, folks, uh, you know, organizations in other nation states challenging the integrity of our of our systems, uh, our, of our de uh, democratic systems. That's done through networks. That's done through the information space. Uh, that's those. That's critical to. To the future of our, uh, to our nation, and and those who share our interests in uh, in a democratic and free society. So it's yeah, it's pretty doggone important. And I believe that uh, more and more professionals, as they get in, and it's not just cyber, it's not just psychological, it's not just the electromagnetic space. It's all of that together. And um, and and those. For example, I talked to some cyber professionals who are very specific, and very technical, and I and I and I um, I share with them that they uh, they have an extra extraordinary technical capabilities, but they're they they are serving platforms which actually have uh, are platforms for cognitive out uh, cognitive effects, and so they have to have an appreciation for that soft SOFT science aspect as well. That's what makes it so powerful, and I'll tell you, our adversaries recognize that, and they and they and they come, they 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 attack our interests with a very balanced approach of technical, non-technical. Understand that cyber platforms are really vehicles for cognitive outcomes. Mm, right, uh, the uh, uh, the weaponization of artificial intelligence and the advances in AI that uh, enable such a powerful delivery of of uh, you know, curated information content and the impacts that that can have are uh, you know just staggering. They are, and and we but we've got some great work going on. The Marine Corps, the Army, the Air Force, with the establishment of the 16th Air Force, the U.S. Army Cyber Command uh, transitioning into information warfare. Uh, the Navy really has all really for many years has been focused on information warfare. So our services, hmm. many of our leaders are taking this seriously now, and 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 we're watching this evolution in uh, in in organization and. Uh, and in capability, so I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the leaders that are there uh, because they get it. Now, it's still a lot of education, a lot of integration. Remember, it's an all-in proposition, so there's still equity walls to kind of dissolve. Uh, so we have this kind of 
more unified effort. Uh, but um, I, I am, you know, I'm pleased to see, I'm pleased to see that Congress has uh, also uh, placed some attention on this and provided some guidance in the recent NDAAs and the department is looking at to organize and, and elevate uh, and elevate the role of um, oversight and management of this space, uh, thankfully. And uh, so we'll see how that all pans out. Um, I'm sure there'll still be some more bumps, but uh, but uh, the you know our adversaries need to be on notice. This has uh, got our attention, and uh, we're uh, and we're we're going to compete. Well, that's all very well said. Uh, listeners can find out more information at information-professionals.org and learn how they can uh, be part of the conversation and contribute. We'll have links to the Toffler books in the show notes. And Austin Branch, thank you so much for being part of the Cognitive Crucible. Hey, thanks, John. Thanks for the opportunity. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.